Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Acts 2, verses 1 to 21. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamedes, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygria and Pelanthia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Somehow, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. May God add wisdom and understanding and breath and ruach and life into these words spoken here today. Please pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, come. In the fire, in the winds, in the still small voice, come, Holy Spirit. Some of you may have heard of a Buddhist teacher who died in the past, I think it was four years ago, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, very, very well known and also uh, known for his peacemaking throughout the world. And I had the opportunity back in 2000, many years ago, um, to spend some time on retreat with his community and with him as well, high in the mountains of Vermont. And basically what he taught us to do was how to breathe, how to breathe, and how to walk. Now, not just to breathe and not just to walk, but to be changed and transformed from the inside out and to then go forth and breathe and walk in such a way that we bring peace to the world around us. He was a prolific writer and one of his books was entitled Peace is Every Step. He gathered us one morning and he took a deep, deep breath and he said, breathing in, I know I am breathing in. Exhaling, he said, 
breathing out. I know I am breathing out. Breathing in. I know I am breathing in. Breathing out. I know I am breathing out. Breathing in. I know I am breathing in. Breathing out. I know I am breathing out. Join with me in your mind. Breathing in. I know I am breathing in. Breathing out. I know I am breathing out. And again. Breathing in. I know I am breathing in. Breathing out. I know I am breathing out. Well, how can this simple, gentle, peaceful act be an act of revolution and transformation? To be aware of our breath, to be aware of the gift of something coming into us and making us feel and be alive and then exhaling it back out into the world is one profound moment of mindfulness. Thich Nhat Hanh and many teachers, including Jesus, taught about living in the moment, in this moment, in this perfect moment. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. Breathing out, I know I am breathing out. The Hebrew scriptures talk to us about Shekinah. This is God's divine feminine aspect. Ruach in Hebrew, Pneuma in Greek, wind, spirit, breath. Author and poet and artist and mystic and prolific writer wrote once, I do not take for granted the presence of breath that sustains and inspires. Years ago, wrote Jan Richardson, I was a teenager. One of my lungs kept spontaneously collapsing. After several trips to the hospital, the collapses were finally halted with a procedure that involved pouring acid over my lung. It was an experience of fire and breath that has forever colored my reading of the Pentecost story. We call ourselves four years out from COVID and still remember the millions of people globally that we lost who died from lack of ruach and breath, from pneumonia. I recall my own about four years ago, just prior to COVID, of contracting a double pneumonia and not finding any antibiotic that was going to work well. And the hospitals became overrun with the mystery of people who had pneumonia. And I was bedridden for six weeks, and I dreamed really deep dreams, and I met my grandfather in my dreams, who I have never met from Ireland, but we had a little whiskey together in my dream. And he is lovely, Herbert Hazen Dowling. I didn't know, honestly, if I was going to make it through those six weeks. And I know many of you have had encounters very similar, where you were not sure if you were really going to take your next breath. I have the occasional cough that is my dearest friend, really, that reminds me not to take my breath for granted, for I was really miraculously healed. During that time of being bedridden, I thought of all the people I love and all the things I love to do, and I also thought about what was no longer necessary in my life, that which was taking up too much space or too much time.
time or too much drama, drama, drama. And I came out of that quietly and yet remarkably changed. The story of Pentecost, the day when we celebrate and ask again for the breath that comes to us, not only individually. This is the beauty of Christianity. Not only individually, not only personally, writes Jan Richardson, enlivening and inspiring us, but also comes to community, those who are gathered together in one place, two or more gathered together in the name of the resurrected one, who enter into the wonder and challenge and brokenness and radical hope of being the body of Christ. Look around, folks. I'm not seeing any Olympic champions here. I can't even finish one round on my flute any longer. But we are the body of Christ. And we are mighty and we are powerful as long as our hearts are still beating and then how much more so after that. We cannot do it alone. And that's what the church stands for. We are gathered in one place. We must rely on what the Holy Spirit brings to us and gives to us. So my friends, how are you breathing these days? Do you remember last summer, the, the smoke that was coming down from Canada and the high humidity and the air-conditioned house or room that you could find refuge? How is the church breathing these days? What inspiration, what inspiration and what is inspiring you that you feel moved? Not only in your own life, but also in the life of the church and the community around you. What breath do you need to take together collectively? Can we just stop and do that collectively? Breathing in, I know I am breathing out. In, breathing out, I know I am breathing out. Is there some hole in your life or some hole in your church or in your community that has allowed your breath to leak out depleting your spirit and compromising the way that God seeks to breathe in and through you? What might it take to heal the hole in the breath again? This morning, I opened up my Facebook at 6 a.m. just as a companion to my coffee. I probably should have been praying, but I was checking out Facebook friends. And in it was um, this incredible video uh, taken of about 17 Haitian people in Milton in a church parking lot, and the Mass Council of Churches was there, and also um, the director for migrants in Boston was there. And it opened up with uh, uh, these people yelling, Open your church, open your church, open your church, they were chanting. You see, yesterday, Milton United Church of Christ opened their church. They didn't know what to do. They just knew that there were 17 Haitian people, many of whom are families, that have been staying at Logan Airport. Did you know that? I didn't know that. So many of our hotels right now are being overrun with migrants. I come from a pristine, white-collar, bucolic town <laughs> called Norfolk. Have you heard anything on the news lately? The people are up in arms because 
they're going to open up the empty prison and house migrants. What is going to happen to our town? Now, there are, quite honestly, some serious concerns. Vaccination, food, supplies, clothing. But rather than thinking creatively, most of us in that town are saying, we don't want that here. We don't even know who these people are. And some of them might be, and you can fill in the blanks. My own family's divided on this, and all I can say is Jesus is coming, look busy. Jesus is coming, how about helping out? Jesus is coming, and things will never be the same, and all I know is this white, privileged, middle-class, over-educated woman met Jesus in Haiti when I was going to help them on my mission trip. Who saves who? Of these people coming to our upper middle class, white, I think we have two or three people of color in town now. Whoa! these people coming to our town to save us? Would I dare preach this sermon in the heart and center of Norfolk, Massachusetts? We might get run out of town even though we've lived there 40 years. If I call you, you need a place to stay? Open our church. Open our church. Open our church. That's what I heard this morning. This sermon, this like, I don't know, it's a long one, six-page sermon. This morning I heard, open your church. And I started visualizing, and I know I'm leaving, and you're probably like, phew, thanks be to God. <laughs> but I saw this church. And I thought to myself, if ever there is a church where two or more have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, it's here. And if ever there is a church like the Milton UCC that would open its doors for one day and provide food and coloring books and balls and games for the children and a place for an exhausted 25-year-old mama to take some rest while other people were watching her children. If ever there was a church, it would be this little tiny hidden gem in East Weymouth. But don't worry, I'm going to be leaving soon. Open the church. Open the church. How do I convince the people in my little itty bitty tiny white Norfolk upper class, mostly Republican people to open the churches? Friends, I think Jesus is going to be making some good trouble. Open the church. May we pray for the migrants who have found their way to our country, maybe illegally, and maybe they do need a process, maybe they do need vetting, maybe they do need inoculation and education and clothing, but think back one, two, three generations, and where did any of us come from? Is anyone Native American? didn't think so. They are the only people who can claim that they are the original Americans. And we, we stole their land from them. And we brought disease to them. And they helped to show us how to survive. Jesus is coming to town.
down. Look busy. 